Hello and welcome to the first Fathom one-to-one -one interview, the first in a series of in-depth conversations between Fathom editors and the most interesting commentators, activists and politicians about the major issues facing Israel and the region. Today I'm delighted to welcome Dalia Shandlin to BICOM. Thank you. Dalia is a leading international public opinion analyst and strategic consultant based in Tel Aviv. She's worked in a range of progressive causes and campaigns in over a dozen countries, including countries transitioning to democracy. In Israel, she's worked for a wide range of local and international organizations on issues of peace, democracy, human rights, peacemaking, and religious identity. She holds a PhD in political science from Tel Aviv University. She's the co-host of the Tel Aviv Review podcast. She writes regularly for Plus 972, and she's a policy fellow at the Mitvim Institute. Today we're going to be talking about a number of issues, the current brouhaha in Israel over the possible legal case against the Prime Minister and relatedly the prospect for snap elections. What, are the, what is the state of the peace process and the ultimate deal? Can we hope or is that process dead? What's the health of Israeli democracy today? A question many people are asking questions about. We'll ask Dahlia's view on that. So we know that Prime Minister Netanyahu is currently under investigation for breach of trust, bribery and fraud. We know the police have recommended to the Attorney General that he be indicted. We know that he says there will be nothing because there is nothing. That's one. Two is that we know Israel very nearly went to snap general elections last week, but pulled back. I wonder if you could make sense of both of those developments, the legal and the political for our, our viewers. Uh, a number of questions come to mind. If he's indicted, can he run? If he runs, Will he retain the support of the right-wing bloc? If he does, can he win? Start anywhere you want. I think if I knew how to make sense of it, if anybody knew how to make sense of it, we may be in a different situation in Israel altogether. It's a complicated situation. There are four cases that are being investigated, and two of them he's an actual suspect. There's a sort of half additional case which might be closed. I think one headline I saw called this a fast-moving investigation. I think that's the best way to describe it. It's really hard to know what's going to happen tomorrow. What we do know, as you pointed out, is that the police did recommend indictment. What we don't know is whether the attorney general will move forward with an indictment. If the attorney general moves forward with an indictment, there is no law requiring the prime minister to resign or suspend himself. We have such laws in place in Israel, but they apply only to the level of senior minister. Uh, so the Prime Minister does not have to resign, and Netanyahu has given every indication that he will not resign, that he doesn't plan on it. It doesn't seem to suit his character. People who know him say he just can't do it. It's not his psychology. So I don't expect him to. Um, it's true that there was a possibility of snap elections over the last couple of weeks, uh, and you know the coalition crisis was just narrowly averted last week. And it's hard to know exactly what goes on in Tanyo's mind, but I think that we shouldn't over-psychoanalyze him. He wants to stay in power. He wants to, he seems to want to, you know, uh, continue working through his term and reach the end of the term. As he has repeatedly said, it's not one of those things where I think we need to question what he really means when he says it. Um, and even though it's hard to continue working under the shadow of these indictments, I think Netanyahu really believes that he's the best thing for the country and therefore wants to stay in office. And like many people in Israel, we have another saying, um, not only the prime minister's sort of quips about there will be nothing because there was nothing, which by the way sounds a little better in Hebrew. Um, we have another saying in Hebrew, which is that you know how you go into elections as a party because you've got surveys. You never know how you're going to come out of them. Because when, at the moment when elections are called, uh, by law, we have to have them no less than three months from that time. A lot of things can happen in three months in Israel. Uh, like, you, you know, you started the question by saying, let's talk about the current brouhaha. And I was thinking, gee, which one is he talking about? Because every day we have a new current brouhaha about something. Even over the last 48 hours before this interview is taking place, there's a massive story about Israel exposing, uh, for the first time admitting, uh, it's the, the bombing of a nascent, you know, a, a very incipient nuclear reactor attempt in Syria back in late 20, uh, 2007, I think, under the Olmert government. And that's a huge issue in Israel right now. But by, by the time we show this interview, it might no longer even be in anybody, anybody's mind. So every day there's new stuff happening. And by the same token, if elections are called three months later, no party has a guarantee of what happens. And I think that's probably the main reason that Netanyahu ultimately allowed the crisis to be resolved. And I say allowed because I think that if he had wanted elections, he would have found a way to let that coalition crisis pull down the government. 
And the investigations themselves have concerned you. I was looking at some of your writing in Plus 972, and you worried that the investigations, and I'm quoting you, were turning into a showcase, possibly a harbinger of the erosion of democratic norms in Israel. What, what, what did you mean by that? What, what concerns you about, I guess, not so much the investigations, but the political um, handling of the investigations? Let me start by saying the investigations themselves, the fact that they're taking place, is a healthy sign in a democracy, should be a healthy sign in a democracy, where different branches of government, specifically law enforcement, are able to place a check on the power of the executive. But the problems with Israeli democracy didn't start with these investigations, of course. You know, no democracy is perfect. Israel's democracy historically has been very flawed. But I would say we saw a serious escalation of the problems of democracy, or I should say deterioration, starting around 2009 and you know specifically i'm referring to a series of laws and legislative attempts bills that were debated that threatened the character of, of democratic society and threatened civil society and other policies that were in place that seemed to cramp free speech and possibly restrain the media so this has been an ongoing debate in israel over the last decade would be one way to put it under netanyahu's leadership would be another way to put it uh, and by many accounts, Netanyahu in his fourth term seems to really think that the best thing for the country is to just focus or consolidate as much power as possible. Now, to retain this level of this status, this stature in Israeli society, he basically has undertaken um, an approach to these investigations that says the investigations themselves are based on nothing but a political putsch. Anybody who is critical of anything that I've ever done is essentially against me politically, and so they're trying to find ways of tearing me down politically, which is an approach that delegitimizes law enforcement in Israel. It delegitimizes the police investigation. It raises questions in the voters' minds, certainly his voters' minds, about the integrity of the attorney general, the media, and it makes, and he's also portrayed it in ways that make it seem like there's a, a sort of almost a political conspiracy going on between the media, the police, the attorney general, everybody who cares and tries to expose any potential breach of law and wrongdoing is being portrayed as nothing other than on sort of political mission to get him out of office. And I think that leads to a dangerous situation where people think on the one hand that the only legitimate power in Israeli society is the executive and specifically one person. On the other hand, that, the other, that there is no other person than Netanyahu. It sort of creates a test of loyalty to the country based on whether you're loyal to Netanyahu. Before we go on um, and look at the peace process, one more question about what's been going on in Israel in the last few weeks. Um, it was reported that one of the reasons Israel didn't go to an election was that Avi Gabay, the leader of the Israeli Labour Party, didn't want them because he thought he would do he would do pretty badly in those elections. What, what's your report card on Gabay's leadership of the Labour Party? Why do you think he was in that position of having to allow his opponent to continue because he didn't feel confident enough? Why hasn't he become more popular since he took over last summer? I will answer that, but just let me point out that Gabay didn't, Avi Gabay, the head of the Labour Party, didn't have any uh, influence in the decision of whether to go to elections because Labour's, of course, not in the coalition, and the elections might have happened due to a coalition crisis. So he wouldn't have any influence over it. Having said that, he made some interesting statements. At first, when there was, when the possibility of elections drew closer, he made a statement in the impl implying we're actually prepared for elections. It's okay to go into elections, but in general, the Labour Party and the supporters don't think elect elections would be a good thing, for, although they would be happy to try to get rid of Netanyahu. But Labour is not expected to do well, as your, your question is really about the surveys showing that ever since he took power, well, he had a small bump in the beginning in the polls after he uh, became the head of the Labour Party in uh, early July of 2017. But pretty s soon that bump began to erode. And then Labour's polling began to drop well below its current uh, uh, power in the parliament in the Israeli Knesset. So if the party currently has 24 seats, but the polls started showing Labour getting 17 and then 16 and then dropping all the way down to the lowest poll I've seen, which had them at 10. What did you put that down to? Well, I put that down to the fact that he made a number of controversial statements uh, that indicated that he was trying to take a centrist, even right-leaning position on certain key issues that are almost like cues in the Israeli debate. So the first thing he, or one of the various things he said was that he um, didn't think necessarily Israel would have to evacuate settlements if there was to be a peace agreement, which could mean lots of things. But in the signaling of Israeli politics, it makes it sound like he was supporting settlements. He made a statement um, referring to um, an old statement 
that Netanyahu had made back in the 90s when he was first prime minister. Netanyahu's original statement was that the left forgot what it is to be Jews, and Gabay sort of repeated it and said, well, the left actually has placed too much value on their liberal values and not enough on their Jewish uh, identity. And that really you know, set off um, bells and whistles, I should say, uh, among core labor voters who understand that he's basically criticizing them for being what they think they are, what they are and, what, and why the Labor Party exists is to support that. Um, and then a few other things like saying he probably wouldn't want to go into a coalition with the Arab parties, you know, lots of things to make it look like he was essentially pandering to the right. And it's not that labor voters are really far left wing, they're center left, but it makes it seem like he's just trying to be like the right and not trying to represent what they feel they represent, which is an alternative to the right. Um, and that makes it seem like he doesn't actually have a strategy or that he's not being authentic. And as a result, many of those center left leaning voters started to say, you know, this party's not going to represent us and they're not really representing an alternative or, or he's not trying to represent a serious alternative. And they began uh, basically moving in the polls towards supporting a center party, uh, Yesh Atid, Yair Lapid's party, which correspondingly has been going very high up in the polls. You know, you work in a lot of countries. I'm wondering if what the Labour Party in Israel hasn't noticed is that we're not in the 90s anymore when triangulation worked. Um, Blair and Clinton and so yeah. on. It's a very different time in which maybe people call it populism or honesty or straightforward pitch to the voters. He, he says what he believes, he believes what he says. It's maybe a new route to power. Yeah, I mean, I have been observing the same thing. Uh, I've been saying, you know, quipping things like, uh, you know, honesty is the new campaigning. Uh, because really, the voters, I think what happened is in the 1990s, the, the profession of political campaigning, and I, you know, mea culpa, I was part of it uh, a little bit later in the 2000s, and we got the idea of messaging down to such a fine science that we had the messaging perfect, but what we kind of underestimated was the voter sophistication. And not that voters know all of the facts and figures. We all know that voters can't keep up with that. But they really do have a barometer for authenticity. And when all that strategizing of this, you know, the, the left-leaning parties to try to move more towards the center, which, by the way, labor tried. It did do that already in the 90s. And in fact, there's a lot of labor's tried that many times over the course of the last two decades. Um, so first of all, in the Israeli context, none of this is new. And secondly, you're right, the voters are much more sensitive to authenticity. Now, the, the ironic thing is that many people think that Avi Gabay was being authentic when he said those things, because that's really where he comes from. Remember, he came from a further right-wing party. Many people are starting to say, well, maybe he actually was never a natural fit for the Labor Party. There's even been rumors that the Labor Party will try to somehow get him out. But I think that, personally, you shouldn't make those kinds of political statements based on polls, or, or political pol um, moves based on polls at this stage. I think it's an irresponsible way to do politics. He was elected in the primary. Um, but yeah, labor needs to realize, you know, if I had to tell the Labor Party how to do, how to kind of put themselves back on the map as a significant voice with a genuine political program, I would say stop trying to strategize. Stop trying to think strategically which voters to get and start actually clarifying to yourselves what you really stand for on the conflict, which everybody knows that labor has a position on the conflict, and they just feel like they're not saying it openly. And so clarify what you mean on the conflict, uh, what you think about the peace process, and what you really plan to do on a social and economic level, specifically on economic policy that might be different from Netanyahu, and then say it fearlessly. But what happens is the parties that are out of power live in a sort of fear that no matter what they do, they'll be typed as the wrong kind of party and they'll never get into power. And I don't think that's the best way to, um, to succeed in, in political competition nowadays. All right, Dahlia, let's move on to the peace process. And let me say straight away, to give you some UK context, I go onto UK campuses and debate this question, which is a regular one, is the peace process dead? And a lot of students out there are, are laughing at the phrase now. They don't take the phrase so seriously. I think sometimes when we're inside the bubble, we, it's our language and we use it, but that, that, that's, that skepticism I wanted to give you as part of the context. Um, I, I say it's not dead, but that time is not unlimited. So I'd be interested to know what, what, what you have to say. But let's, let's look at some of the actors involved in the process. I want to start with Israeli society, and I wanted to start with a new book by Mika Goodman, which is being debated, and to quote you something that Mika has written and ask for your response to it. This is what he, he argues. He's really talking about why the peace process is, is frozen at the moment. He says this, the right and left have become mirror images of each other. The right no longer believes that settling the territories will bring redemption, but says withdrawal will bring disaster. 
The left no longer believes that withdrawal from the territories will bring redemption, but says remaining will bring disaster. Left and right have undergone similar processes. They've both moved from hopes to fears. And I think what's interesting is that he then adds that what a lot of ordinary Israelis have done is they've absorbed both arguments, which is what maybe is a little bit different about his book, which is he says, uh, it's possible to absorb and believe in and be moved by the arguments of both the right and the left. And the result of that, he says, is a kind of paralysis, not just at the level of negotiations, but maybe something deeper, culture, psyche, whatever we want to call it. What do you make of that argument? Do you think he's onto something? Um, if he is, how does Israel map its escape from that, that dilemma? Well, I think it sets up a nice phrasing because it's very balanced, but I don't agree with all parts of the equation. I think the part that I agree with most is that Israelis have re replaced hope with fear. In other words, if you talk about peace, Israeli-Palestinian peace, or the new Middle East, that there's no longer any hope of that. Hope is just gone. And fear of changing the current situation is certainly a prominent reason why people don't want to change the current situation. Fear of what would come next. And it's not a totally irrational fear, because in the Israeli perception, whenever they changed in the direction of a peace process, there was a wave of suicide bombing. So that's, you know, they, they don't see you know, too many other intervening factors. They say, we had, we had peace processes in the past. They, they, they made our security situation worse. We're afraid of that. Might as well stay with the status quo. So I agree with that part of the equation. I don't totally agree with the part about what the right and the left believe. And I think it leaves out the center. And the center shouldn't be left out, because it's a significant part of the Israeli body politic and our political leadership. Um, on the right, it's hard for me to see where he comes to the uh, conclusion that they no longer believe in settlement. Uh, the settlements have grown exponentially since the last, since, you know, well, the, the, the milestone negotiations of Camp David in 2000s. There are about double the number of settlers between East Jerusalem and the West Bank relative to what there were in 2000. And in case uh, the viewers don't know the numbers, we're looking at somewhere around 600,000 settlers right now. Um, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, uh, there are more settlements, but more importantly, the strategic locations of different neighborhoods or, you know, um, little communities that are either full, full, full settlements or just little additions to settlements are being developed all the time in areas that make the situation almost irreversible. They basically generate more contiguity for Israeli territory, less contiguity for Palestinian territory. It's a very dynamic situation that leads to, you know, essentially there's not much room left for a Palestinian state that is in any way viable, and that's happening all the time on the ground. The other thing is that these settlements are becoming more and more permanent. So you have decisions like turning the university center at Ariel to a full-fledged recognized university, and that makes it very hard for Israelis ever to imagine Ariel University or Ariel itself not being there. That's, those are policies driven by right-wing governments, particularly so under the Netanyahu government. And so I'm not sure where he comes up with the conclusion that the right no longer believes that settlements uh, will be redemption. I mean, maybe not in the theological sense, but certainly there's a lot of focus on Israel you know, doing everything it can to remain there. Uh, in terms of where the peace process is, I mean, it's true that when you say the word peace process, it doesn't seem to refer to very much. In language, you know, words are reference for something, and when there's a nothing, then it makes the phrase seem a little bit funny, which is why I understand why people are laughing. I don't use the term peace process very often because we don't have any formal negotiation process. We haven't since 2014, since the last process begun in 2013 under Secretary of State Kerry broke down. Um, and in terms of uh, the possibilities for getting back to one, well, Israeli society supports negotiations uh, by a majority, but they have increasing trouble supporting the kinds of solutions that would be the result of negotiations. A, you know, according to public surveys, uh, the Israel Peace Index, you know, over maybe close to two thirds would support negotiations, but only about 20% think negotiations will actually work. And we know that per you know, perceptions of viability, in my studies as well, in the Israeli Palestinian survey that I conduct, Viability is very closely connected to people's level of support for the two-state solution and the actual detailed implementation of a two-state solution. In the most current survey that I've done uh, together with my colleague, Khalil Shikaki, this is an Israeli and a Palestinian survey from December of 2017, and we ask whether Israelis and Palestinians support a two-state solution in general, we have fewer than half of both, of both Palestinians and Israeli Jews, 46% of both, exactly the same, who support it. So we're losing the consensus that that even is the right approach. And in that sense, people can support a process, but if they don't support the end goal of the process sufficiently, we all know the process isn't really going to lead anywhere. Now you have the situation with the Trump government where 
you know, the Trump government has managed to alienate the Palestinians so severely that they're not planning on even receiving uh, the peace plan that people uh, have been talking about that the Trump government and, and uh, you know, the envoys have been working on and apparently have, and it seems to even be ready from what I'm hearing, but they're not sure how they can release it if one of the parties of the conflict isn't speaking to them. And so all this leads Israelis to something much less dramatic than the hopes and the fears and the despair and the, you know, the redemption or not redemption. It's much more about what's wrong with the current situation. Uh, for Israelis, things are basically okay. Life is going on and security is not too bad from the Israeli perspective. Of course, that's the mirror image of the Palestinian side where every day is a struggle for them to end occupation because they're living under a 50-year military rule. But Israel is the stronger party, and there's a self-reinforcing cycle between the public and the government where the government doesn't really want to change the situation. The people aren't driving the change because things are basically okay. A lot of them might accept a change if it was real and you know, imminent, but they're certainly not going to agitate for it. And then there's this perception among politicians that if they do anything in the direction of peace, specifically concessions, they'll lose some of their voters. So it's sort of self-reinforcing -reinf political status quo in the conflict on the Israeli side. Sometimes it's striking how little politics, the, the stuff of politics, is able to influence this process. For instance, I hear a lot of serious, intelligent people on both sides saying there's a number of steps that could be taken, interim measures, that would both not damage Israel security, improve conditions on the ground for Palestinians, be fully supported by the regional states and the international actors, and would hold open the two-state paradigm. Um, and, I, and these are practical, hard-headed people from the security echelon, political experts, and so on. And yet, year after year, we seem to be stuck in, uh, in, in a different kind of situation where those things don't happen. I mean, how can, how can they happen? What, what, what's, what's stopping them? The government's decision. That's political will. I mean, I, I can only agree with your analysis. Why don't they happen? You know, I, I, I can't totally explain it because, as you point out, the security establishment is often making statements and conveying their attitudes that if conditions were better for Palestinians in terms of allowing them to be more mobile, allowing them to have more import and export, specifically in Gaza, having more connection, more freedom of uh, you know, mobility between the West Bank and Gaza, that their conditions would improve and their social conditions would improve. And that's not only possible, and it's not only not threatening to Israeli security, it might improve Israeli security. In fact, I've, done, I've conducted surveys uh, specifically a survey about Israeli attitudes towards the policy in Gaza showing that a majority think that if Palestinians' life in Gaza was better, it would probably be good for Israeli security. They get that connection. So it's not the public that's stopping this. Um, again, I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze exactly why the leaders make that decision, but I think, again, there's this perception that if the status quo is working okay, why you know take any risks? Um, I also think that if you understand that the current Israeli government and the, the current coalition in particular does not want a two-state solution. You know, that, first of all, that has to be understood. There have been rhetorical statements here and there in that direction by Netanyahu since, his, since he came back into office in 2009, but all of his policies on the ground and specifically the kinds of coalitions that he's built have precluded it, and then he started making statements very openly himself that he doesn't want it to happen specifically before the, on the eve of the previous elections in 2015 when he said there will never be a Palestinian state on my watch. He said he won't divide Jerusalem. These are indications that he doesn't intend to get to a Palestinian state or a two-state solution, and his coalition partners say it very openly. So when you understand that, it becomes very clear why the government isn't doing some of the kinds of things that would improve Palestinian society. Failure to improve Palestinian society weakens Palestinian leadership. It makes Palestinians hate their leadership because they see their leadership as failing them and failing to confront Israel and win any gains from Israel. And that puts Palestinian society in disarray, um, and it, it weakens the prospects of the current competing parties if there were ever to be elections again. It weakens the prospects of there ever being elections again in Palestine. And that makes it easier for Israel to govern because they don't actually have any pressure to contend with you know, serious Palestinian, legitimate Palestinian leadership. So it, it becomes easy for them to dismiss the idea of a peace process. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, Please. <laughs> so I, I read your columns regularly in, in Plus 972. Wonderful. Um, recommend everyone else read them too. <laughs> yes. Um, you often end your column with the words, end the occupation. Do I really? I hadn't noticed. You do. I, and if I don't, but if I, but if I do, that's good. And if I don't, I hope I get it somewhere in the middle of the column. Well, when I was a much younger man, I used to end my columns that joined the party. And I was struck by how, how often your columns end up with um, end the occupation. Um, 
Now, sitting more or less where you were sitting a few years ago, I was talking to Benny Bagan. And let me put to you what he put to me about the idea of withdrawal. And he said he was against it for two reasons. One is he said, when Israel made the most generous offer conceivable through President Ahmed, shortly afterwards, uh, the Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas said to the New York Times, the gaps were too great. And Begin said, what he drew from that was that there's no conceivable offer Israel could ever make that the Palestinians could ever accept. So that was his first reason. His second was, and this is more or less exactly what he said to me, Hamas will eat Fatah up in two weeks on the West Bank if the IDF aren't there, and we will then face uh, a security challenge of a, of a wholly different kind, which could bring Israel to a halt from the high ground of the West Bank. So that was his second reason. And they're, they're powerful reasons, even for those of us who, 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 who support the two-state solution. So how would you go about responding to Benny Bagan's points? I mean, these are really serious things. I, first of all, I would not dismiss either of those possibilities. I think that Hamas is strengthened the more Fatah is weakened. You know, so if you're doing everything to make sure that Palestinian society doesn't improve and people increasingly blame Fatah for that, then Hamas gets stronger. Whenever there's a war, Fatah, uh, Hamas gets stronger. And whenever there's a, a concession, something that looks like a concession to Hamas, which is how the Palestinians interpreted the disengagement, they get stronger. So that was a unilateral action that you know, basically made, made Hamas look like heroes to many Palestinians. What you want to do is try to reward Fatah for what they had been doing in the past, which is starting to change. But, you know, up until, and including now, Fatah essentially is a party that supports diplomatic negotiations. Hamas is the party that supports militarist approaches to ending occupation. If you reward the party that supports a diplomatic resolution with material gains on the ground, that party is likely to do better. And so if you want to set the stage for Fatah being the dominant party, that's what you have to do. Now, in terms of where things are right now, first of all, if there were actually elections, the parties are close to one another. Fatah usually is doing a little bit better than Hamas, but we don't have elections coming in time soon for the Palestinians. So it's true that the possibility that Fatah would win elections is always, sorry, that Hamas would always win elections is always out there. In terms of social chaos and breakdown, again, I think the policies that keep the Palestinians unable to develop anything like sovereign powers under military occupation, including an economic life and increasingly unable to develop democratic norms or actually ero their own democratic norms are being severely eroded uh, due to the way Fatah is leading for all sorts of reasons, that th then you create conditions for social chaos. That's where you're more likely to see a takeover. What we want to avoid is a situation of social breakdown where elections can be held, where you can have you know, civic political life to absorb people's frustrations and anger. And right now, the more social chaos is likely the more likely you are to see a takeover in a, you know, in a violent or, or forceful sense, whether it's actually violent or not. So, I mean, I think it's, like you said before, it's really about creating the right conditions. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, my, my colleague Todd Gitlin, my friend and colleague who wrote, you know, who, who writes uh, very prolifically about the 1960s and was a leader, you know, of the Students for Democratic Society. And in one of his books about the 60s, he says, people were always asking us, how should we leave Vietnam? And we, he said, we used to answer, on boats. And I say, OK, you know, by the same logic, it's not that simple, of course. But I think the first step has to be to dis that Israel needs to decide that it doesn't want to govern Palestinians through a military rule, which is what's been happening for the last 50 years. We have to remember, it's not just about Israel politically taking over the land. It's governing 4.5 million people under a military regime. And you know, the political resolution may be far away. We may not know what it is. But ultimately, I think we have to lay the groundwork for, you know, for civic rule. And it sh you know, if you want a two-state solution, then it should not be Israel's civic rule. And you have to let, set the conditions for that. We've talked about the Israelis and you've talked about Trump a little. Let's talk about the Palestinians a bit, a bit more detail now. Um, let me paint a what I think is a depressing picture. And you can tell me if I'm being too depressed about it and, and that I'm missing things. Um, President Abbas has been reduced to calling the US ambassador to Israel uh, the son of a dog and wishing that President Trump's house falls down. That's how bad that is. Um, last week, a roadside bomb laid by Palestinians targeted the convoy of the Palestinian prime minister during his visit to the Gaza Strip. Fatah and Hamas, as their latest attempt at reconciliation, has stalled yet again, and they're both attacking each other as to why. And you mentioned Halil Shikaki before. The latest opinion poll, uh, which I saw a few days ago, um, very striking quotation right at the beginning of the report. Uh, he was talking about the Palestinians, and he said, I quote, 
pessimism, frustration and despair leaves the public with no trust in its leadership and very little optimism about the medium or even the long-term future. So I guess my question is, you often hear the idea that Israelis have no partner for peace, and I think sometimes that's said in bad faith by people who don't want a partner and don't want peace, but it's also said sometimes, often I think, by people who really do want peace, who really do want the two-state solution and really don't think they've got a partner. So I guess after all that, what I'm asking from you is, if you step back and you give me an assessment about where Palestinian society is at, I was talking to a Palestinian recently, for instance, who said there's a process of disintegration going on, kind of cultural political disintegration. I was asking what are the main political currents and so on, and she just stopped me and she said, Alan, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's depressed, it's demoralized, it's chaotic. Um, there's, there's not a kind of political scene in the way you want to find one. So what's, what's your estimate at the moment of the Palestinians, their ability to enter into negotiations, to make an agreement, and to bring the society with them? Yeah. It's a very important question, but it does go back to some of the things we talked about before, about how to change that, which would be laying the groundwork and the conditions for improvement. But of course, the social disintegration that we're seeing, I mean, I think I wrote an article about this back in maybe 2013 or 14, and I called it Who Lost Gaza? Because a lot of this starts with the separation policy that Israel's had in place. Uh, between Gaza and the West Bank, so doing everything possible to make sure that there's very little connection between them. Why is that such a central factor in the social disintegration? Because it puts such um, an obstacle over normal social relations and normal economic relations. It stops students from studying for higher education who are coming from Gaza and trying to study in the West Bank. It stops commerce and trade. Um, and it means families are separated. And it basically means that you have two societies among Palestinians that are developing in very different directions. They're developing different political cultures, of course. I mean, I think we can't divorce the separation policy from, you know, the Palestinian political split. Um, it, so it creates two different political cultures. It makes Gaza more isolated so that different social trends take over. So they're developing, I say, along different political lines, religious lines, economic lines, um, and, and general social cultural lines. And that creates you know, the deep fragmentation of Palestinian society. There's also internal fragmentation in the West Bank, partly because of different um, circumstances that have Im an impact on their economic life, like access to Jerusalem, yes or no, what you do or don't can have a significant impact on your economic situation, the ability to travel. Um, and of course, the distrust in leadership that you talked about is very real. I mean, my colleague Khalil Shikaki surveys, um, you, know, you, you quoted his analysis, but the numbers are very stark. For about the last maybe two years, we've seen a b roughly two-thirds going up as high as 70% after the Trump speech of people who wish uh, the, uh, that Mahmoud Abbas would resign. And so that's not as, at all auspicious, of course, for Abbas having the authority or legitimacy to move ahead on a peace process. And then you ask, what does all this mean for a peace process? Well, obviously it's not good. Um, I don't think that you know, that Abbas has any great legitimacy to sign, an, you know, a peace agreement. If he did, he would face, you know, a lot of internal turmoil. What I do think, again, to go back to the conditions that ha can help improve Palestinian society, listen, for any peace agreement, whether it's one state, two states, or whatever the parties want, am I doing this right, like President Trump? Um, whatever it's going to be, it will only benefit from Palestinian society having greater parity with Israeli society on the political and economic levels. And so anything that improves the economic viability of Palestinian life, ideally with greater independence from Israel, although maybe not even necessarily. The economies are interdependent today. They use the same currency today. Uh, the, you know, I have my colleague Bernard Avishai thinks the best hope for Palestinian society is to develop a highly skilled tech sector that can then do outsourcing for Israeli tech companies instead of always being you know, the unskilled laborers. But, and, and of course, Israel sells to Palestinians. They're the closest market we have. And, a captive market, obviously. Um, so I'm not even saying they have to have an independent economy, but they have to have economic viability. Um, and those are the things that can help stabilize society. The other thing I would say is that there needs to be an emergency approach to salvaging Palestinian democracy. Like I said, the Palestinian Authority is, and Mahmoud Abbas in particular, is losing legitimacy at a free fall because he has been implementing authoritarian um, approaches to governance you know, breaking up and sometimes arresting demonstrators. The press is not free. There's a deep perception of deep corruption on the Palestinian Authority. And these kinds of things make it impossible for Palestinians to trust that they would, to trust their government to the point where their lack of trust in their own government makes them dislike a two-state solution. Uh, it's connected. In other words, and, and Khalil can show you this in the surveys, because 
people become increasingly um, disinterested in being governed independently and permanently by an authority that looks like the Palestinian Authority. So the, the more improvement there can be to Palestinian democracy, the more likelihood you'll see of any peace process being able to get off the ground and any leader emerging who has the authority and credibility to do it. And that is something that I think the entire, um, both locals, both Palestinians and Israelis, should think about how they can contribute to it. Israel through, through their policies of controlling Palestin Palestinians, Palestinians themselves through committing themselves to their institutions and democratic structures, and the international community, which of course gives you know, a lot of money to Palestinian Authority, um, needs to prioritize its focus on strengthening the democratic institutions of Palestinian life and, and investing in projects that will strengthen the values of liberal democracy. Not that I'm saying Palestinian society has to be like a Western liberal democracy. They can do what they want. But you know, the ability of people to think freely, express themselves freely, organize politically, develop new political parties and institutions is crucial to getting a situation where you have a legitimate leadership that can then have the, author you know, the legitimacy to move forward on a peace process. So we've talked about actors. Let's talk a little bit about what still goes under the name of solutions. Um, they might sound a little bit um, otherworldly, but I think part of the purpose of intellectual debate and discussion is to, is to give certain ideas a platform and to work them through. Because as you, I think, have pointed out, uh, two states for two peoples was an otherworldly idea not that long ago. So um, we don't need to spend too long, I don't think, on the two-state solution because it's so debated. Um, I go on campuses and I say it's, it hasn't finished, it's not impossible. Um, you, maybe you could start by saying what, what you think about that, whether you've definitively uh, given up on it um, or, or, or not. But the, the solution that I think you've been maybe championing is too strong a word, but certainly wanting to discuss and wanting to debate is what sometimes is called, awkward word, confederalism. Uh, sometimes a better one is a two-state confederation, maybe. And I think your point is that if two states is unviable, there's a very limited number of other options. One is um, one equal state. One is one unequal state, whatever that's called. And the other is some kind of a confederation. Now, leaving the technical detail, of which there's a huge debate aside, just for the first part of this, um, what is the basic idea of confederalism and why were you attracted to it? The basic idea of a confederation approach, and I agree with you, the term is kind of awkward and heavy, it's basically two separate states with two separate governments with full independence and sovereignty, but they agree to have a more integrated relationship, an open, a more open border, a more porous border. The citizens of each side are allowed to have residency on the other side without actually having citizenship according to numbers that both sides agree on. They share certain powers and they, uh, by agreement, of course, um, and they sh and they have a shared economic zone, and they address security concerns together, and they share things like resource management together. It makes sense in the situation where you have two parties in the same territory that need some sort of territorial division, but that the geographical nature of their relationship makes it very hard for them to actually operate completely independently of one another. Um, and so you're looking at partial separation. It's like a you know we can consider it a hybrid approach between separation and together. Um, it still falls on the side of what one colleague of mine, Palestinian colleague, uh, academic colleague called Bashir Bashir says is a statist approach because it does look at the creation of two separate states. It's based on, you know, th that e these are nation states, but allows them to have a more flexible, integrated relationship. And maybe integrated is even the wrong word, just more overlap um, and recognizes their codependency on one another and puts structures around it. I think the other important point that, uh, that Yossi Balin makes, because he's another outright supporter of this, is that this is a voluntary arrangement. In other words, if this kind of agreement were to be reached, the, the parties would enter an agreement and they would have the ability to leave the association between the two states. Uh, without, and that means without going to war and without disagreement, there could be an agreed formula for how to get a divorce. It's important to keep that in mind because nobody can say that this is the perfect solution. Nobody can say that any per solution is perfect, which goes back to your question about why I was first intrigued by it, then began researching it, and ultimately, I do support it. Although it took me a number of years of thinking about it and looking at the situation on the ground to say, you know, I actually actively support this. I, um, and I think the first reason is that I think the two-state solution is in many ways no longer possible, certainly not in the form that it was being, that it was first conceived of. Uh, it was conceived as the idea that their Palestinians would have full independence along contiguous 
territorial portion. Of course, Gaza is not contiguous, but there could be ways to link them. Um, and the level of sovereignty that they should have as a state is no longer possible, according to the current maps, um, because of the spread, permanence, uh, and number of, of, of settlements and the number of settlers. Um, and not just that, right? I think the political conditions aren't there on either side. So I think it's very, very hard to get there. Just to give you an example of these empirical conditions, by all of the best assessments I can gather from the different security and political figures I speak to, the number of settlers who would be left outside the probable border or the reasonable border for anything like a contiguous Palestinian state would be somewhere between 120 and 163,000 people. Now, by, for comparison, in 2005, when Israel left Gaza, Israel had to dismantle settlements that, and that involved evacuating about 8,000 people. And it was very, very hard. Now, some people say, well, we did it. Israel was able to do it. It can be done. It probably can be done physically, but can it be done politically? Is there a moral, political, or legal justification for doing it, especially for people who've been in their homes for two, three generations? It gets very dicey, and it gets to be almost impossible. Now, that's the feasibility. But I also came to critique the desirability. And this was a major change that I had to, um, you know, I came to it after a process of thinking about what a Palestinian state in these circumstances would actually look like. Um, some people say Netanyahu negotiated in good faith during the Kerry process, maybe so. But the kind of Palestinian state that would be viable either at that time, certainly in 2013-14 and now, would be so dismembered and chopped up um, it's beyond the Swiss cheese. Uh, we're not looking at Swiss cheese, we're looking at tiny little bubbles that could barely be connected. In other words, the Palestinian state wouldn't be Swiss cheese, it would be the holes in the Swiss cheese. Israel remains the, you know, the entire, it would, Israel would basically be surrounding Palestine and puncturing it everywhere. Um, and so I think that that kind of state wouldn't be viable. I think it couldn't develop a significant economic life and a sense of sovereignty for itself. I think that would lead to such resentment and social disarray that we're likely to see, you know, everywhere from spoilers among extremists to mass unrest. And then, you know, that would easily lead to escalation of violence and Israel could easily want to go in and, you know, um, violate Palestinian sovereignty. And then that would prove to Israelis that it's not possible. I think that we under, you know, some people underestimate the dangers of what a two-state solution with a hard separation would bring. The idea of a confederation opens that up and, and addresses and erodes and maybe even resolves, although I use that word very cautiously because I don't think anything is completely resolvable, some of the key obstacles uh, and dangers of a, of a, of a two-state with a hard separation approach. Um, I think you know, one of the main ones has to do with settlers. The idea that you can allow a certain number that has to be agreed on, but uh, allows people, settlers, to live on the Palestinian state as permanent residents. They have to be law-abiding, of course. If they're not law-abiding, they can't live there. But that you know, it, it sort of diffuses this major ticking time bomb within Israeli society and on the Palestinian side, you will never get Palestinians to agree, any Palestinian to agree on a two-state solution or any solution that doesn't recognize the history of the Palestinian refugee problem, the causes of the Palestinian refugee problem, and promotes a solution that is acceptable to them. What's acceptable to them? That's complicated. But the idea that you can let a symbolic number, again, it would be a number that Israel agrees on, live in Israel as permanent residents, not citizens, means that they can have their symbolic needs recognized. It, they will not threaten the character of Israeli society, which is, you will never get Israelis to compromise on that. It's very hard to get Israelis to agree on any number of Palestinian refugees being allowed to live in Israel because they fear that they will vote a different kind of government into power. You have to erode those obstacles. And then Jerusalem. I think the idea that Jerusalem, which we didn't discuss yet, but in this approach to Israeli-Palestinian um, you know, peace, a two-state confederation, Jerusalem wouldn't have to be divided down the middle. Any two-state solution based on a hard separation imagines and plans for a border running right down what we call road number one, which is actually the extension of road number 60, but who's counting? It divides the east and the west right through the middle of Jerusalem today. Forget about how much violence that seems to do to the fabric of life in Jerusalem for me. I'm not living in East Jerusalem. And the people living in East Jerusalem are already living in dire economic and social conditions, and they will get worse in that kind of a division. Uh, it will create another barrier to, you know, the kind of interaction that leads to uh, greater levels of ultimately development um, among the Palestinian neighborhoods. 
interactions, I think, that are healthy in some ways, economic development. I mean, those things will all deteriorate if there's such a hard separation on the Palestinian side. And I started to look at these conditions and say, you know, it's all well and good for me to support two-state separation because it sounds theoretically nice. Uh, and as a political scientist, it might be nice for each side to have total self-determination. But am I really taking into the account the interests of a Palestinian living in Isawiya? Not really. And I think they will be better off. And I'm not doing this in a patronizing sense. I think it's good for them and good for Israelis to have Jerusalem remain open and those other major obstacles addressed in a way that really does take into account both symbolic and empirical needs. And I think it's more viable for that reason, also economically and security cooperation. I think it actually stands to be better when the society, when the when there's greater interaction between the two security forces, rather than having one state of total sovereignty, the other one of total hermetic sovereignty, and any sort of overlap is considered a violation of sovereignty. I'm not sure how that's supposed to work anymore. Although I, you know, I'm not a security expert, and there are plenty of security critiques of this plan, I should say, as well as economic critiques. Uh, but personally, I think that the more remote the two state the traditional two-state solution is, the more those critiques are simply not as strong as they might have been. So we, at BICOM, we had some informal discussions with a group of Israelis and Palestinians last year, and one of the solutions examined in detail around the table by, by everyone was, was this. What struck me was that on the plus side, people were pointing out that actually it's not that far away from the UN partition plan of, of 47. There are many overlapping elements. People think that partition plan was just a line on a map. It was much more than that, and, and central to it was, was all the things you've said about economic cooperation um, between two small states in a very enclosed area with a particular topography and so on and so forth. So, that, so there's that. The other thing people say that's positive is that in terms of people getting to have their narrative intact uh, and not having to give up on it, this might be the way to do that. And, and then just practically, not just symbolically, but access for Jews to the holy places in Judea Samaria and so on, where they think of as the heartland, et cetera, et cetera. The people on the other side of the debate in those discussions, I mean, a quip from one was that she'd just fallen back in love with the two-state solution, having heard the confederal solution laid out. And I think on a serious point, what she had in mind was she thought it was ahistorical as an approach. It just ignored the actual history of the two peoples, the wars, the distrust, the, 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 the conflict, that you couldn't get from the conflict to confederalism. She said you could maybe, and she wasn't too optimistic about this either, but maybe we could get from the conflict to two states, self-determination, sovereignty, and so on. She thought it was impossible to get from the conflict to confederalism. So I guess my question is, do you have anything like a roadmap with some basic signposts in your head about how you get from here to there? Well, I would start by saying, like I said before about the peace process, you've got to, like in any of these solutions, you have to lay the groundwork for peace. You have to do everything you can to strengthen Palestinian society, democracy, and economy, you know, allow a legitimate leadership uh, to flourish there. I mean, all those conditions need to be in place to reach any agreement. So in terms of how to get there, start with that. Um, but I would say in terms of her point that it's ahistorical, quite the opposite. I think the idea of a two-state solution with a hard separation, whereby it becomes much harder for Israelis to visit all the holy sites on the West Bank, is essentially wiping out the entire history of the Jewish people that has made the, you know, that has driven Zionism. I mean, I'm not sure how that can, you know, how, how to square that circle in a two-state solution. On the Palestinian side, I think her statement ignores the history of the Palestinian Nakba, which is the, what they call the catastrophe of 1948. Uh, you know, we may not, you can like or dislike this description, but the fact is that is a sort of, um, you know, really key portion of their national identity. And as we can see from many other societies, first and foremost Jewish society, but also for example, Armenian society with, you know, the very, the very intense focus on the world recognizing the Armenian genocide, by, this, by similar logic, the Palestinians need to have their great moment of national trauma recognized. And that recognition needs to take symbolic form and empirical form. Ignoring that is ignoring history. I think the confederal approach uh, does a better job of recognizing that and coping with it. I also want to point out that the idea that it involves full freedom of movement is separate from residency. Residency allows people to live on the other side and vote only on their own side. But the idea is that anybody could move if they don't have a security background, if they don't have you know, security suspicions. It doesn't mean that there's no border. It doesn't mean there's no security. But the default is that people can move. That means visiting, uh, you know, Palestinians can visit their old villages for a day trip and just see what's there or not there. 
It means Jews who have no interest in settling in, Palis in the Palestinian areas can go and visit the holy sites as much as they want. It means people can work as laborers uh, if you know Palestinians want to work in Israel um, as laborers, which has been you know in the past a major driver of their economy. It means people can visit their families. I mean, it allows for you know. Uh, uh, yes, you have to recognize the past, but it also allows for a more positive future on the symbolic level and social level and on the empirical level of being able to improve material circumstances. Let me ask you one more question, Dahlia, about the, um, under the heading of peace. Um, very interestingly, you, as we said at the top, are involved with MITVIM, which is the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policies. One of the things you've been doing there over the last um, year or so, I think, or two, has been looking at other conflicts, including Cyprus, South Africa, and so on, and trying to mine those conflicts for anything of value for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So, simple question, top line, two or three things, what have you learned? There's so much to think about. I'm really happy you raised this because I think the first thing that I would like to tell anybody who's watching is that we should be doing this kind of thing. And this is, you know, I have no, no personal interest. I don't gain anything from it. I just think that it's a very valuable uh, way to look at human beings, right? We're all human beings. I think it's valuable to remember that we're not in the worst conflict of the entire world. There are other conflicts that are just as bad. Our enemies are not the worst enemy ever to be confronted. Um, we're not the worst victims ever in history. Putting your own conflict into perspective allows us to kind of put our, it allows us to just put ourselves into perspective and I think it helps lower some defenses. So I would just first of all say I certainly learned that the comparative approach is valuable. Having said that, I want to move on to talk about some of the specific issues and maybe I'll just tie it to begin with with, your, with the previous topic about confederation. I always get asked where has this ever worked in the world? And as a comparative you know, advocate, um, there are two cases that are maybe sound counterintuitive at first, but one case where a confederation-like approach, not necessarily called a confederation in either case, um, has been used to keep the peace and to actually create the peace. And keeping the peace, I'm talking about the European Union. The same concept, not necessarily called a confederation, but independent states that are in a voluntary sort of association where they can voluntarily leave, as you so well know, um, have managed to cooperate on economy, security, law, residency without citizenship, and it's really helped to keep the peace after the world's worst ever conflict in human history. I think that's a valuable lesson from other parts of the world. Another one is Bosnia. Again, very controversial to say this is a success because there's lots of criticism, but the fact is that uh, a separate and together approach, again, not called a confederation, but where, where both uh, the, the parties that were at war at a, in, in a very brutal context uh, reached a political constitutional arrangement where they had separate entities that are in, uh, involved in a, a, a single state arrangement but with a lot of autonomy, so much autonomy that there's criticism that they have trouble functioning together, which is why it's almost more like a confederation than what it's actually called, which is a federation. But that was used to end the war. Now it's created massive problems. Their joint government is often paralyzed. Uh, people say the agreement needs to be updated after 25 years. But for 25 years, well, 1995, 23 years, since the Dayton Accords helped to end the war in Bosnia, they have not had war or conflict escalation along ethnic lines. Now, we can't go one day without having some sort of violence among the Israelis and Palestinians. I'd give a lot to see us go 23 years without having a serious escalation. So I think there's what to learn from there. That's one specific thing that came out of the research. Another, I mean, there, but there are many. I mean. I think um, one of the uh, most important aspects to think about is when negotiations should be held or not. Because if negotiations are held under poor conditions, and I mean by non-legitimate leaders or when, the, uh, when their failure could lead to violence, it might be better not to hold them and work on improving the conditions that can lead to successful negotiations afterwards. Uh, that's one thing. Some, we see in, in some of these other conflicts, uh, that sometimes it takes people from the hardline nationalist right to be able to move ahead with concessions, which is why I think we can look at Netanyahu as somebody who has had extra responsibility uh, for moving ahead or failing to move ahead on the peace process because he has the legitimacy. Like we saw, for example, in Serbia where you have you know, nationalist Serbian leader who was able to move ahead, on a, again, a process that everybody's very critical of, um, on a, an initial you know, set of principles for a future agreement with Kosovo. Another thing that I came to realize is that sometimes international, you know, the international community looks at nego conflict negotiations and says, well, 
we have a hard time reaching the final status agreements. Let's start with the principles. Let's start with some technical things. Let's start with the easier issues and leave the final status stuff for the end. We can that way develop confidence building measures and trust. And then we'll get to the really thorny stuff. And this goes along with an approach that's sometimes called constructive ambiguity. We don't really know where the process is going, but we're trying to put steps into place that can help it work. Again, this goes back to the Serbia-Kosovo process that began in 2013 to this day, which was you know, a huge breakthrough at the time and considered a very you know, strong basis for hope. Uh, also in Cyprus, uh, the negotiations that have happened have often you know, left a certain level of ambiguity about what the final status would really be between the two sides, even though it was supposed to be around a framework of bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. But how that would actually be implemented is kind of, again, constructive ambiguity so that each side can sort of read into it what they want and they can get to the final stages after there have been trust building measures into place. I became very critical of this approach. And I think also in the Israeli-Palestinian case, we can go back to the Oslo years. When you're negotiating an agreement and you don't know where the agreement is supposed to go, the every additional negotiation over the next step becomes instrumentalized by both sides to try to determine what will be the final status. And the entire process becomes like a tool to fight the political battle. And so I, I think that maybe there still is a role for constructive ambiguity, but I think we have to also raise the possibility that it can be destructive ambiguity and that sometimes we need to start with the final status stuff, get them off the table and out of the way. And you know what I hear Many Israeli security figures say, for example, is that whatever the political leadership decides to do, we will find a way to make it work on the security level. In other words, the political decisions have to be made. And then we'll find a way to implement. I mean, I'm extrapolating. We'll find a way to implement. By the same token, a human rights lawyer told me one time, if we're trying to think of ways to link Gaza and the West Bank, whatever the political decision was, there could be a technical solution for it that allows for mobility. And sometimes I think we've placed too much emphasis on pushing off the things that we are afraid to deal with when they maybe should be the first things. Get the traumatic, difficult, complicated parts out of the way and then find ways to implement. You know, this kind of thing we've seen, you know, we've seen the results of failure in Cyprus where for, you know, all these years, all these decades, almost as long as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or actually about as long, depending on when you start counting, right? Everybody starts counting at different phases. Um, they haven't been able to resolve their conflict. And I think we have to take into account that problem of refusing to really call, uh, to call uh, the final status by its name and let the parties start adjusting themselves to that reality. So we're sitting here in London um, in a world of pro-Israel advocacy and anti-Israel advocacy and lots of debates on campus. I was debating um, the Palestinian ambassador on, on, on campus a few years ago and we sat before we went into the room and we worked out that uh, that night in that building, in that university, which was King's College London, there were four events happening on Israel-Palestine. So... And they were all pro this pro or pro anti, that. And, yeah. you know, sometimes I think our concern is that there's a kind of style of advocacy which is a, a bit punch and judy. So the, the debate is then framed for everyone as a, a... not something that you think through carefully and maybe relate to both sides and be constructive, but that you take a side and you cheer or you boo. What, what, maybe I'm wrong about that, but from, from where you see it in Israel, what kind of advocacy, what kind of activism, civil society activism, is valuable, is productive for resolving the conflict? I think it's a very good question because the international community definitely has a role, and I, and I do agree with you, I'm sorry, we agree on so many things, that most of the international civil society activism, I'm not talking about government policy right now, is either always takes the form of being anti or pro-Israel, anti or pro-Palestinian, and if it doesn't actually actively take that form, it's certainly portrayed by other advocates as taking that form. So, you know, I think that there's a tendency to just recreate the conflict in international civil society, and I, don't, I also don't think we should generalize and say international civil society. There's probably, you know, specific approaches in America, in the UK, in other European countries, maybe you can break them down a little bit more sensitively. But I think that there is really a need to reject this idea that something, for example, that strengthens Palestinian democracy is good for both sides, full stop. It should not be seen as pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian. That's not the point. If it's pro-Palestinian, I get labeled a traitor. If I say I want it because it's good for Israel, I get labeled a hypocrite because I don't really care about the Palestinians. Who cares? It's good for both sides. 
in general, it's better, I think, for people to live under a democracy. I'm, you know, I hope that doesn't generate criticism that I'm imposing my worldview on everybody else. But I, I don't see how you can go wrong for the peace process, for Palestinian day-to-day -day life, for eventually in the long term a better situation for Israel to live next to a more democratic state. Uh, we know that when we test something like that as an incentive for, for convincing people who are currently uh, opposed to the detailed implementation package for a two-state solution on both sides. We test it among Israelis and we test it among Palestinians. We say, okay, you're opposed to this package today, but if Palestine was a democratic state, would you change your mind? We get about 40% or in the upper 30s who change their mind just because of that. So I think that you know, if civil society really wants to change the situation on the ground, they should be looking for opportunities to make that case uh, you know, among international communities that can possibly give money and support and projects and know-how um, and maybe get involved. And, I mean, you know, if, I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but I think those, you know, first decide on the goals and then figure out how to actually implement them. Uh, that's a good thing. Anything that makes the case that you cannot sustain a situation of a 50-year military regime governing 4.5 million people is a good thing for both sides. And I just don't think that has to be seen as pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian. It is not doing Israel any favors to have every new generation of young people do army service where the main focus is on controlling Palestinian lives through a military regime. And it's, you know, the IDF is the ultimate sovereign. In Area C, the IDF is taking care of Palestinian civil life. I mean, the civil administration is a misnomer. It is run by the Ministry of Defense. You know, and that's something that I just don't see why any Israeli generation of young people should have to go through. I don't see any reason why any Palestinian generation of young people or old people should have to live under. And I can't see how living under a military regime is going to contribute to Palestinian support for peace to live side by side with the people who were dominating them in such a cruel way for so long. Um, and so I, I wish I didn't have to make that argument, but I think that it's not obvious to people why this is not good for either side and that opposing a military regime over Palestinians is not anti-Israel. It is not pro-Palestinian. Hopefully it's pro-both. And certainly it's pro-future peace. Dalia, thanks very much for talking to us today. The series will go forward listening to figures from the right, the left, and the center. But I think you've been so articulate today and so interesting. I think it's a great start to the series. So thanks ever so much. for. Thank you so much. You promised to disagree with me more, but we'll try for next time. Excellent.